Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Flavi Bodo. I'm the CEO of um, ECM, and I have pleasure and also big mission today to introduce this conference on, on behalf of our president, Petra Stusek, who unfortunately lost her voice. So she, however, says hello to you personally, and she will be with us next week. And of course, we uh, wish you a prompt recovery. And I cannot tell you how much Petra and myself we would have loved to be physically present at our conference in one of the beautiful European destinations instead of being online with you now. And because networking, exchanging knowledge, building trustful relations is at the core of our industry. And this is our motto at European Cities Marketing. We meet, we share and we grow. Um, I would also like to give you a special welcome to all of you participants also all ECM members, all industry colleagues, I know that there are some here. And one of our important part of our community is really our partners. They are supporting the network, our members, via knowledge opportunities, enriching you know, debates, and we will hear many of them today with their own data and views. And I would like you to give them a big round of applause uh, you know, after their presentations. The power of community is also, uh, you know, welcoming our newest members and we are always proud to see how our family is growing despite all the current, uh, you know, context. So, and also welcome to um, some of the destinations present here that are not, you know, members yet, but who are in the room today and we are looking forward to welcoming them soon. Um, as I said, we meet, we share and we grow. And today we will dive into the big question of what comes after the pandemic and what has been the impact on destinations, consumer behavior, traveler and booking patterns. So this first ever ECM pre-conference is meant to warm up your curious questionings and exploration skills before our two days conference next week on Thursday and Friday. So I strongly invite you, if you have not done it yet, to join us you know, for those two days. If you have not registered yet, or if you are not sure, just contact my colleague Julie uh, to update your registration and invoice. Because we have an impressive lineup of 20, uh, sorry, 80 speakers and some 45 sessions to whet your appetite. And even if we are not meeting live this time, our conference will be the opportunity to network. We have prepared for you an impressive rooftop, you know, I'm there now. And while well, it's not available today because it's only the pre-conference, but you will see that next week, you will be able to start video conversations with other attendees or join the DJ music, or uh, you can also have group discussion, you know, in some lounge areas or join me um, at the bar as well. So, and if you look over the edge, which is just behind me now, you will discover we have a special secret for you. Uh, and before we start, uh, I would like to give our warmest thanks to the group now who have done a tremendous job in, you know, putting all this program together, all this knowledge and insights for you and their creativity and inspiring thoughts will for sure inspire us, you know, over the week to come. And we wish that this will lead you to implement new ideas in your destination and in your companies. Thanks a lot for your attention and I wish you a very nice and productive day. Thank you, Flavie, with those words of welcome and a little bit of barking in the background. I like it. Um, we are now kicked off on our first pre-conference ever. And for those of you who do not know me, my name is Sini Jongastel. I am co-founder of Group Now, and we are, as Flavie said, working very closely with European Cities Marketing to program these conferences and uh, power them up. And so I will be um, the lead moderator both today and uh, next week for the two-day conference that we have then. And so as many of you will have noticed, the theme of the conference is this is not a tourism conference. And you could, of course, ask why not a tourism conference? Uh, I'm assuming you've wondered this. Does that really make sense at all? Because ECM European Cities marketing members are all tourism professionals. But of course, this is not a tourism conference for many reasons. First of all, our world has been turned upside down for, um, uh, for throughout the pandemic crisis. We need to look at our industry, um, at our partners, at our businesses, uh, at our visitors, our marketing activities, our commitments with fresh eyes. 
With the pandemic crisis, it feels like everything has been thrown up in the air and now we're trying to make sense of it all in the way that it's coming back together in new shapes and forms. This is not a tourism conference um, because tourism is so much more than an isolated phenomenon. Even as an industry, tourism is really sort of almost uh, really difficult to box. It's seven or eight industries in one sort of multi-sector. Um, and it's also about the role, the impact and responsibilities of tourism in our societies, in our cities and communities. Tourism as codependent and as integral to the places in which it takes place and accountable. Um, and this is not a tourism conference because throughout the conference, later today and next week, we'll also be seeking inf inspiration from industries outside of, and perhaps at first glance, not really related to tourism. We will be taking ourselves out of our industry and sector echo chamber, you could say, and we'll be looking at inspiration of how have other industries dealt with the crisis? How are they working towards a net zero future? Or how are they trying to grasp what that future might look like? So today is our pre-conference, and as I've already said, it's the first that we've ever done together with European Cities Marketing. And it's important for me to say that it's not a sneak peek, really, of what's coming next week. Today is a conference in its own right, um, and we'll be diving into our now of still ongoing crisis, the reshuffle of tourism and competition, of visitor behaviors and preferences, and our tomorrow of dealing with the changes uh, and the opportunities that follows. Um, basically what we've been facing throughout the past 18 months. So what we'll be talking about is not tourism as we know it. This is tourism as we're getting to know it. And our speakers today will help us expand and explore that knowledge. We'll explore the next normal in the immediate and the shorter term, you could say. Sort of the urgency of understanding the changes that are happening right now based on the data that we have available right now, and then inspiring how we deal with it, both in our actions and our activities and in our ways of making decisions in this still very, very uncertain time. Um, and so next week, uh, September 23rd and 24th, we'll be diving into what you could say was the more long-term visions or views of this VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous um, world that we're living in and the role of tourism in that. So next week we'll be discussing climate action, decarbonization, COP26, socializing tourism, making tourism accountable to local communities, taking responsibility in addressing the role of tourism in some of the challenges that we have in modern day societies. We will talk about stewardship, about partnerships, about funding models and placemaking, and we will explore what we can learn from comedy in addressing these really difficult questions ahead, um, how we can, what we can learn from esports and adapting business models, explore the impact of business events and the impact on our industry's brain drain from this crisis and what it takes to re-attract and retain talent. We will discuss the renaissance of tourism and how our cities can be sensed and made sense of in multiple layers. So, that's what's happening next week. And for now, I think we're ready to dive into the now of next normal. And we're so happy that you're all here to dive in with us. Um, because again, this really depends on all of you. The questions that you are going to ask of our speakers will help sort of us guide the way through what sparks your interest? What are your needs? What um, made you more curious? Or what perhaps resonates with some of the challenges and some of the needs that you face in your everyday? So ask away. And yes, I realize that these sort of virtual formats can feel like a one way street, um, but that's really only if you go one way. So I will encourage you to go multiple ways and you can do so by commenting in the chat, sharing if there is a speaker point that you um, resonated with, that you had a reflection in relation to, or of course, go to the Q&A and ask questions. I will be keeping an eye out for anything that comes up. You can ask questions while speakers are speaking speaking or you can ask questions after where we have time for uh, diving in further. So um, keeping with the image of the two way street, I'll also warn you that traffic is going to be uh, coming fast um, and I need you to buckle up because today is a packed um, program and we have multiple formats that we're playing around with today and that we'll also be playing around with next week where we also have a couple of other formats coming. So we'll be starting out with our horizon format, format horizon format, that's the first time I said that out loud I think, where we're taking a broader look at what's happening now and where we're heading and then 
we'll have a series of faster classes, which are speedy master classes with speakers, each of different perspectives with different data sets and insights and methodologies and tools to share. And then we'll finish off today with our very first outside incomer perspective, um, which is also a disaster class, basically a format where we explore the tools that will prepare us for crises to come and managing the uncertainty. Um, and so with all that, enough talk on my part, maybe a quick stretch to prepare you for the coming two and a half hours of faster classes and disaster classes, and also prepare your typing fingers for comments and questions as we go. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, or I should say the first two speakers of the day for our pre-conference. We will be joined by Magnus Hespo, Marketing Manager, Business Intelligence with Visits.com and Chairperson of the European Cities Marketing Knowledge Group on Research and Insights. And we will also be joined by Professor Karl Weber, President of Module University Vienna. And they'll be talking to us under the title of What the Benchmark? Um, because they'll share what are the highlights and insights of this completely new ECM benchmarking study, uh, benchmarking report 2020 2021, which will demonstrate the impact of COVID on European cities and city destinations and the big reshuffle that we've been through with this pandemic crisis. So, Magnus and Carl, floor is yours. Thank you, Signe, and thanks to you. All Europe for attending at the unwrapping of the first results from the 17th ECM benchmarking report. My name is Magnus Hespo, uh, working as marketing manager at Visit Stockholm, but also the chairperson for the ECM Knowledge Group Research and Insights. And I'm merely the producer of this session. Uh, we are going to have a quick look on a unique report, I would say the biggest one when it comes to city tourism benchmarking. Um, and the report is actually a former product from the benchmarking group, but from this very summer, it's in the hands of the ECM Knowledge Group Research and Insights. Thank you for that confidence. And thank you, Module University, being really the analytical brain and the well, production muscles of this report. Thank you. Without you, we couldn't enabling this report. Thank you also to the former leads of this precious report from Vienna, Clemens Kölzbünge, and from Paris, Thomas de Jean. Vielen Dank. Merci beaucoup. Now let's dive into the results of 2020. And I know you are looking ahead now for the autumn. You're curious how was actually the past summer. Why is this taking so long time? Well, we had a deadline for data input end of April that we actually stretched to beginning of July to have as many cities participating as possible. We had quite some crisis management during the, uh, during the spring. And I'm very happy to communicate that we have 107 cities aboard. So 107 thank yous to all of you participating in this report. I must warn you though, there are quite some minus, minus and minus in this report, but I'm also very happy to say plus six, because uh, in this report, this year's report, we actually have six new cities joining, four Dutch cities, one Swiss city and one Spanish one, Mark T in bold text. So extra thank you uh, to you and welcome to the world of benchmarking. Uh, so, okay, uh, let's have a look on the results. I keep repeating this number 107, but that's the one and only figure you will hear from me, because who could possibly present the percentages and figures better than the Tormis database wizard himself? So it's time to uh, leave uh, the east part of Scandinavia and go to Central Europe and hand over to Professor Dr. Karl Werber, who will please uh, kindly guide us through this very bumpy statistical ride. I had seen him say, buckle up. I say, fasten seatbelt, because we have 15 slides in, in less than 15 minutes. So let's go, Carl. Yes, so thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, uh, hello also to everyone. <clears throat> uh, I will start uh, the series of slides with this very depressing, uh, uh, with some very depressing figures of this table of the top performing cities in uh, 2020. 
which basically show demonstrate that there was a significant, uh, let's say, drop in basically every city in among those 107. That the difference in terms of drop varied between minus 32 percent, which actually the best performing uh, city this year in the report, which is the city of Klagenfurt in 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 wonderful Austria, uh, Carinthia in particular. And in the, the worst performing city, which is Loret de Mar in Catalonia and Spain, uh, with minus 85%. Uh, but when we're looking at the top performing cities, we can see uh, also a number of very interesting uh, uh, structural changes because some of the cities, which normally always appear uh, as one of the better ranked uh, or top ranked uh, cities now, uh, have dropped uh, uh, based on the on the changes we, we could see uh, in the in, in during the pandemic, and some of the cities which uh, which which were always in the in more in the midfield uh, base uh, are now showing up uh, uh, in the top. Like for instance, the city of Stockholm, which has been ranked number thirteen in two thousand nineteen, now ranked number six, or the city of Hamburg, which uh, has been ranked number twelve, but in this uh, particular year has been ranked number seven. Whereas, for instance, the city of Rome, which are usually always uh, among the top uh, four cities, is now dropped down to the rank number nine. And the city of Barcelona, which uh, uh, is, is always normally among the top uh, seven cities now, uh, has, been, uh, has dropped down to rank number uh, 14. <clears throat> uh, in general, we can see, and when we look at the total number of bed nights, uh, that in particular German cities benefited uh, a lot uh, compared to other uh, European cities in this uh, particular year of the pandemic. Um, overall, uh, I have to say on average, we have about 7.6 million of uh, bed nights only uh, uh, among those uh, 15 top uh, cities in the year 2020. In the year 2019, just for comparison, we had 26. Uh, 5 million, which basically means that the average uh, between uh, those top 15 of, of 20, 2019 to 2020 dropped by uh, 71%. Uh, it goes even worse when we look, of course, in the, at the international uh, bed nights only. Um, here we have a, a, a quite similar situation. Also here we can find a number of, of, of changes. For instance, um, we have a city like the city of uh, uh, Amsterdam. We have winners here as well, like the city of Amsterdam, which was previously ranked number eight, is now ranked number four, or the city of Istanbul, which has previously, previously ranked number uh, uh, four, is now ranked number two, which is all like, a, a, we can say, a, the turbulence is uh, uh, in this particular, uh, particular year caused uh, by the pandemic. Whereas we have also some uh, other cities like uh, the uh, uh, city of uh, uh, Barcelona, which dropped from uh, the rank number four to the, to the rank number uh, eight, or again, the city of Rome, uh, who dropped from the rank number three to the rank number nine uh, in this comparison uh, sorted by international uh, bed nights. Now, when we look into the source markets, we can also see a number of changes, which are mainly caused, of course, by the fact of travel restrictions and, uh, and by the fact that uh, we could actually see some in a European uh, travel during the summer period 2020, mainly caused by the source markets of Germany and France, uh, which uh, uh, has, has moved up to the first and second rank in terms of most important source markets in 2020. Uh, of course, still considering a minus of 66% uh, of for Germany and 70% for France. Um, but of course, the number one uh, source market for city tourists in the United States dropped to the fourth uh, place with a minus of 88% uh, and, and similar uh, high minus percentages we can find for other uh, overseas markets in this uh, particular year. Now, the same or similar as I say picture we can see when we look at the source markets uh, individually, <clears throat> uh, 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 
uh, sorted by relative change rates. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, we can see that the total uh, domestic uh, market or domestic market market was what really helped uh, city tourism uh, during the pandemic year. It had only a drop of minus uh, 53 uh, percent, whereas the overseas markets, those have been the one and those markets which were heavily uh, hit by the pandemic, like Italy and Spain, are the one with the biggest minus uh, uh, in, in uh, during the pandemic year. Now, of course, this result is also something which we uh, can, which is reflected uh, by uh, the tourism density uh, in 2020. I selected this chart because it, it gives a very good, uh, let's say, uh, insight. Uh, about uh, the impact of the pandemic, which we have seen uh, last year, uh, the first two months, January, February, uh, still normal, or actually even an increase of uh, bed nights uh, in city tourism. And then of course, March, April, and particularly April and May, uh, the, the, the periods of lockdowns all over uh, Europe uh, with the, with the, with the careful opening in June, July, recovery slightly, uh, and then again, uh, the lockdown period in October, November, December, which can be seen, which has, of course, also major impact on the tourism density, uh, which is the number of bed nights uh, uh, in, in relation to the population numbers. Um, when we look at individual uh, cities uh, density, you can see a similar picture. Uh, the average density here uh, in, uh, in 2020 is uh, 3.25 uh, compared to the year 2019, where we had a density of 9.21. It's basically one third of the demand, uh, which would, we could see in the year 2020. Uh, it's significant uh, drop for basically every uh, city in the database. Um, what is remarkable is the city of Opatia, uh, which has still a density of 42.8, but please be reminded that Opatia in the year uh, 2019 had a density of 117. So still it's one third drop also for the city of Opatia uh, in this uh, particular year. Now, a similar picture when we look at the bad occupancy, disastrous, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the overall uh, performance, 21.3% uh, bed occupancy in, on average compared to 2019, where we had a bed occupancy average of 51.3%. Uh, cities like Banal, Turku, and Dijon were still doing relatively okay, whereas uh, kind of the worst uh, occupancy rates have been observed in January, Split, and Dubrovnik in 2020. Now, when we look at the, uh, at the comparison uh, and the development of source markets between uh, European cities and uh, European nations or countries, <clears throat> then we can actually see that uh, the order of importance of source markets became more similar uh, during the pandemic uh, to the degrees of demand uh, of the US market, yeah, which dropped to this fourth place, which I already mentioned. Uh, and the other overseas markets. So now, let's say the, the pattern uh, of the source markets between ECM report cities and nations during the pandemic were more, more similar uh, than, uh, than, uh, than previously. Uh, also in terms uh, at the market shares, uh, city tourism has generally lost in every market. Uh, so basically the drop uh, of market shares uh, in every market uh, is between five to 7%, which also shows here, demonstrates here how city tourism was hit uh, significantly, uh, more significantly uh, than uh, let's say other forms uh, of tourism, rural tourism. Uh, uh, and, and this becomes very obvious by comparing uh, uh, those results of 2020 uh, with 2019 and looking at the market shares. Also, when we look at the overall market shares, uh, <clears throat> we can see this in the year uh, 2019, city tourism overall had a market share of 21.8%, uh, 
Now in the year 2020, we have a market share of 11.5. Uh, um, uh, similar, uh, maybe not that, uh, not that, uh, not that strong is the is the drop in market share in the domestic market from 14.6 to 9.1 percent. But of course, terribly strong uh, is almost 50 percent less uh, uh, drop in in terms of market share is in the international market where we have originally a market share of 30 percent uh, and which is now 16.4 uh, uh, percent only. So after many years of market share gains, city tourism in 2020 uh, uh, had to observe a major setback. Uh, uh, and, and this is basically uh, which will be the new starting point uh, for the recovery uh, in the future. Finally, uh, also the difference between cities and nations is also well reflected by the relative change rates by source markets. The nations <clears throat> Uh, are, are generally slightly better, uh, as you can see in, in for all source markets, remarkably better, however, in the German uh, source market, which basically stresses that uh, the Germans um, and their uh, interest in sun and beach destinations more or less preferred rural, uh, uh, let's say, regions or destinations, uh, particularly during the summertime uh, last year. And, and of course, uh, that's, the, that's, with, that's very well reflected uh, when we're looking at this graph, this different travel behavior of Germans compared to other nations uh, last summer in particular. <clears throat> in the report, you will also find analysis uh, uh, by Premier League and by second division uh, cities. Overall, we, may, we can observe that smaller cities or let's say what we call second division cities are also less hit uh, uh, than bigger cities during the, the pandemic. Well, this has mainly to do with the fact that uh, second division cities always had a tradition of a higher proportion of domestic travelers, um, which during the pandemic has even increased to 65% uh, percent compared to 53% percent, uh, on average uh, for the premier uh, league cities. Now, this is a lot about uh, the past. You will find a lot more information about, uh, um, about uh, city tourism development in 2020 in the ECM benchmark report. Uh, before I finish, I would like to give you also a small insight into the outlook of 2021, which you will find on our uh, uh, tourism information system Tourmis on the Tourmis website, uh, where you find the web address here. Um, you, you will see, uh, and then also you find the update on the latest city trends inside the system, and there is a snapshot of the latest trends uh, <coughs> table uh, on the right hand side. As you can see, since uh, April, uh, we basically uh, observed already, uh, let's say, green figures again, or let's say increases, yeah, which is the positive news yeah, here. Um, and we can actually see that there is the recovery on the way uh, in city tourism uh, as well. And, um, and, and basically, uh, when looking at individual cities, you may also observe that this recovery mainly starts in uh, cities which have an affiliation to a seaside or are connected to a seaside or, or to regions with outdoor activities like hiking, uh, for instance, in the Alps and things like that. So those seems to be the first cities who, who really uh, can see a, a stronger recovery already than other cities uh, at the moment who seem to be the first who will get out of the, uh, the pandemic uh, at the moment. Uh, you will also find on the website of Tumi is an interesting slide, uh, which you see on the left side, uh, which, this, which demos, shows you the city tourism uh, development in 2019 uh, and compares it with the development in the year 2021. And you will see here the percentages, uh, the percentages you see here is the percentage of recovery uh, compared to the year 2019. This slide can not only be uh, used from, uh, let's say, a retrieved from the, from, the, from the website of Tourmis, 
but you can also use this link here as a bookmark, for instance, in your web browser to get you know, a, a monthly update uh, on the CT tourism recovery. So you would have that on your desktop, or, or you can also embed this link into your website uh, of your DMO. Well, you can download the full report by the end of the month on the ECM intranet. It's available for all ECM members uh, for free. Uh, <clears throat> and if you have uh, more details uh, and information you need, uh, then you're of course also always free to contact uh, uh, myself. Uh, and those of you who are not ECM members joining us today, you can also uh, order the report Please get in contact with Pauline Kroger from European Cities Marketing. She will help you in order and you provide the information you need in order to, to order the report. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, of course, we are open for any questions you may have. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Magnus. Um, we do actually have a question um, from Carola, who is asking, do you think that the policy established in each country regarding the work from home policy might have influenced tourism and may the domestic tourism development be related to this? Well, uh, I think uh, um, I think that the home office policy and the, uh, has definitely made some changes in, in behavior. Uh, uh, for, for business uh, purposes in the same. I'm pretty much sure that, you know, the, uh, the increase of online meetings and online opportunities will have an impact, particularly on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the meetings industry in the future. Uh, this is certainly something which uh, we will see. Um, I'm not so sure if this has directly been readable from the domestic figures, but uh, but I think in general, it will be something that we will be able to observe. I think there are pros and cons as well. I mean, we in Sweden, for instance, we've had quite some French travelers coming to Stockholm because you have a little bit more uh, freedom to roam here during the pandemic as well. Uh, so we gained from that. And our, the city center of Stockholm really suffered when where most offices are and people work from the outskirts of the city where on the other hand from local cafes in the suburban areas actually benefited a little bit of course the accommodation facilities really suffered from the lack of conferences day conferences etc but um, pros and cons i guess we we don't have a lot of time left but i do have one final question for you as well which is which cities do you think will be the quickest to bounce back and why maybe a question for each of you I think what we can see, those cities who are related to a, a you know, uh, to a, a sunny beach area yeah, and uh, this related to, a, to to outdoor activities, as I mentioned before, are those who are the first who will be recovering at the moment. Yeah? Um, um, people like to have, uh, you know, uh, to spend, uh, let's say, their leisure period uh, in in combine it uh, with typical leisure activities, these cities will be the ones who have it easier to get out of the uh, crisis than, than those who are, have been focusing mainly on business travelers uh, uh, in the past. I also, I also think the cities that historically have had a large portion of long haul travelers, far away travelers, might take some longer time to recover as well. That's what we're seeing in the figures now. Uh, but I also think, out of sustainability reasons, the cities having good train connectivity also can benefit from uh, the future travelers. And then I'll, I'll just one final question that came in as well was Do you think the old structures of sort of cities dominated by international visitors versus domestic, domestic visitors, will that sort of return that old structure of those um, yeah, different kinds of cities, you could say? Well, I, I think so. I mean, the world population really grows. Are we 10 million people in 2050? So the, the, the demand uh, of traveling and the future interest will be there. I mean, now the DMOs are pushing, you know, to get, you know, the local industry to work again. But in a couple of years, I think we will have to hold back again and capping tourism because I think as soon as the policies uh, 
will disappear and we allow more free traveling again. Uh, traveling will search and, and grow really strong again. Mm. We tend to forget that. <laughs> All right, well, brilliant. Thank you both for joining us today and for sharing these interesting results. There is uh, absolutely no doubt that we've seen changes and it's been a turbulent time and we can see that from the benchmark report as well, um, which, as you said, is also available to dive into. So, so thank you, Magnus and Carl. Uh, and we're actually going to shift gears a little bit and um, move ahead to our next speaker. We're starting, we're quick starting our faster class series now to focus on how these changes are, you could say, coming to life through the new demands and preferences of uh, consumers and travelers. And so to help us understand uh, the new consumption patterns and booking patterns and the traveler profiles, we'll be joined now by Anna Boduja. Um, who is business development manager with Mabrian Technologies, um, who based on their full cycle travel analytics methodology, um, will share her insights on the pandemic impact on travel behaviors. So Anna, please join me and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to participate in this event. I am, as the time is short, I go directly to the presentation. Uh, so for those of you who don't know Mabrian, we are a travel intelligence platform. We analyze multiple data source of uh, travel industry and provide actionable insight based on real-time data. We work with both transactional data and a behavioral one, would give us an option to uh, not only to know what is going on at its destination, but also explain why things are happening at the destination. With all a data source that we manage, uh, we can analyze the full cycle travel analytic, all the stage of the visit, from the inspirational moment when our visitors, future visitors, just inspire themselves by information that they found in uh, social media and the internet. Uh, we can analyze what the uh, prices for accommodation or for photo they see during their search. Once they arrive to the decision-making moment, we analyze their booking patterns, such as booking window, length of stay, and et cetera. So once we know these patterns, we compare the booking patterns to the search one, so we can understand the way our visitors make the decision. Once at the destination, we continue to monitor their behavior. So from the social media, from the mention they share in social media, we can analyze what are the main interests or perception they have about the destination. We also know the data of uh, their spend patterns or mobility patterns. This data source can help us understand on what and how much our visitors spend at the destination. Also, if they come for the one day trip to the destination or stay longer. And to complete this cycle, we analyze the review and also social uh, uh, in social mentions shared in social media, so we can analyze uh, their experience, how they evaluate the experience. And this will be also very important information for the future uh, visitors because it's what they will find during their inspirational moment when they just will search for the information about the destination. So each data source provides us different information, but sometimes we need to cross several data sources in order to find the answer for the important questions. So today, as you know, uh, that the um, pandemic impact all aspects of our life, the way we socialize, the way we live, the way we work, the way, the way we pay, and of course, the way we travel. But do you know how the remote work affects the way we travel? Today, I want to share with you some of the insights that came out from our study that analyzed the change in the behavioral patterns of the new travelers, the travelers after the pandemic. For this study, we analyzed two types of destination, the urban destination and holiday destination. And the period of the study is from 1st of uh, June till of 31 of August. And we compare this information with the same period of time of 2019. So let's see. The longer holiday become much more popular this summer. The average of length of stay increased almost by 40%. We can see that this trend is stronger for the urban destination, where the growth is of 64% compared with 2019 and 22% for holiday destination. 
What can be the reason? Of course, the remote working is one of the main ones. As we can work from any place in the world, we can stay longer and we, we can combine the holiday with the work and stay longer at the same destination. Another reason can be for that also the COVID restriction, the more complex uh, process to travel that we need to make some tests and uh, to refill different documents. So people prefer to go to one destination and to stay longer. We also see that this year our visitors spent different than before the pandemic. This uh, insight comes, of course, from the uh, spend data source. And one of the main trends is that spending in, in accommodation fell sharply. I must say that this category of accommodation in this study includes on the payment made at the destination. What means that all payments made in uh, through different agency, OTAs, or the platform for short holiday rental are not included here. And this can might this might be the reason that increasing the demand in short holiday uh, accommodation offer. But I'm sure that Pierre is going to present after me and will give us more information in this field. Another uh, interesting insight that come out from uh, spending analysis, we can see that uh, the spending on restaurants dropped by five percentage points for urban destination and three percentage points for holiday. At the same time, we see a very important growth in uh, spending in grocery stores, 13 percentage point for urban destination and 10 for holiday. So what, can, what we can understand from here, so our visitors stay longer. They prefer alternative uh, accommodation type. They spend less in a restaurant and spend much more in uh, grocery stores. However, despite all these changes, uh, retailing in urban destination and accommodation in holiday destination continue being the highest spent category. This year, our visitors not only spend different, but also uh, spend more. We can see the growth in the average spend per card holder for both urban and holiday destination. I must say that in holiday destination, the growth is higher. The reason for that, of course, the length of stay. We stay longer, so we spend more. Another reason for that can be the change in the visitors' profiles. Think about all these travelers who used to have uh, long haul uh, travels. This year, I needed to choose a destination closer to their hometown. So it's different kind of travelers that we see. And of course, all of us who um, used to travel often and couldn't do it in last one year and a half, finally, when we uh, were able to start to travel again, we have more budget available for the travel expense. From social media, we can see that interest uh, for uh, tourism products has changed as well. First of all, all outdoor activity increased, interest for outdoors activities increased, such as active lifestyle, sand bathing, and family activities. And for the hand, we can see that art and culture is the category that is losing most the traction compared with all other analyzed categories. The reason for that, of course, many of the activities uh, didn't open their door this summer. But also, I think that the uh, uh, virtual culture offer that is uh, available now can also affect this trend. Another interesting data is about how we plan our trip. We can see from the analysis of search data that uh, the travelers opt more for last minute pre planning than before. For urban destinations, the advanced search period days decreased by 19%. And for holiday destination, the decrease is of 10%. So I think because of all the continuously changes that we see in the restrictions in the way we can or can't travel, travelers feel much uh, more comfortable to plan their trip closer to the desirable uh, travel date. So let's summarize. Who is our new traveler? So uh, the trends are the same for urban and for holiday destination, but the impact is a little bit different. So the new travelers start to plan their trip with less day of advance. He stay much longer at the destination. He spent less in restaurants and much more in grocery shop. Prefer outdoor activity. 
show more in, less interest in art and culture product and prefer different kind of accommodation. Will those trends will continue in the following uh, season? I don't know. And actually nobody knows because we are living in this continuously changing environment. But the uh, real time data analytic can help us with that. So we can understand the global demand, the new preference of the travelers and base uh, our marketing strategy and promotion and travel offer on this data, on real time data. And of course, help, uh, this data can help manage tourism in a more uh, sustainable and effective way that is the objective of most destination. This was just a very small part of the study that we made about the change in travelers' behavior uh, since the pandemic. If you want to know more, I want to invite you to visit our site and to check our study that we publish in the, uh, on our blog. And of course, follow us uh, in the social media where we continue to publish our new study. And if you have any questions about Mambia, you have here my contact details and they will be glad to answer to your doubts. Thank you very much, Anna. That was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, what, as you were going through the results, I couldn't help but wonder, what do you see in terms of differences between the different segments? Like, um, are there are people traveling in different company, more solo travel, more family travel? Do you see any of that in your data? In this analysis, we didn't uh, focus on this, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, for sure, there's a change also in the traveler, um, in, in, in type of travelers. Mm. In type of travelers, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the uh, trend was here, and we also choose this insight as well, because it's a, more about city destination. We wanted to check if the change is the same for holiday and for a, um, urban destinations. Yes. But of course, the analysis can be made uh, much more deeper. We can analyze different markets, how react different markets, you know, the, for sure it's not the same, you know. Or also uh, analyze different type of travelers, family in front of couples. I wonder, one final question before we, we jump on in our faster class, but um, I wonder if, I was a little surprised to see how much the sort of demand for culture and attractions has gone down, has decreased, as you said, in an urban context. What do you think? I mean, I understand that there's an increased demand for outdoor activities, but what do you think, what, what other reasons could there be for this in your, in your view and in your analysis? One of the reasons that I'm sure that's not all uh, activities related to uh, art and culture product uh, were open this summer. Right. So Some of them said closed. And also many of them uh, give, uh, gave us the option during the, uh, this time to enjoy uh, this offer uh, in a virtual uh, form, you know. So maybe also this new way to enjoy the art and culture product will affect the demand. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that will be interesting to follow where that is going. But you're of course yeah. right, everything has been open. Okay, well, thank you so much, Anna, for joining thank us you. for now. I We're going to jump on to our next speaker, um, next faster class presenter, uh, Pierre Besseril, who is CEO of Transparent. And he's going to, as Anna also mentioned, zoom in on accommodation and specifically short-term rental. Um, and what's really, what's happening with short-term rental throughout this pandemic and the potential of this sector also for perhaps an even quicker recovery. So Pierre, please, the floor is yours. Super, thanks, thanks, thanks everybody for having me today. I'll jump right in. Uh, you know, Transparent is a um, data provider focused on everything that you can rent that is not a hotel. Basically, if it has a kitchen and you can rent it, whether it's a villa, a house, a bungalow, we track it, right? So I'll jump right in. And I wanted to start with a, a slide that I found really cool, um, which shows how much gross booking uh, generated booking.com and Airbnb um, every year since they generated 13 billion. Why 13 billion? Because it's, it's a common point. At some point they reached this milestone. Uh, and basically we put it um, on the X axis here, how many years have passed since then. And what I found super interesting is to see how, you know, before COVID, you can see the impact of COVID on Airbnb and here impact on, it, on, on booking, how, um, you know, how they were growing at a very similar pace, right? And basically what you can see as well here is that 
COVID sort of like hit Airbnb and make them go back in time two to three years. So they, they, they you know, COVID made them find the same level of business that they had two to three years ago. But booking, which is much more exposed to hotels, actually went back seven to eight years uh, backwards, right? So I think there are two main messages here. Is like one, you know, vacation rental, much less affected, recovered much quicker. And two, uh, if some people are still dubious or, or are not sure that, you know, rentals can grow as much, um, as much more, well, I just wanted to show you how, how they were growing before COVID and how this, you know, aligned with a big OTA like booking.com was proven to be massive, right? Um, anyway. With this small word of, of introductions, I wanted to, I think since a smart class or, or fast class, I wanted to start with a, a few misconceptions, uh, you know, about rentals. So these slides, some of you may have seen it several times. Uh, I love this slide. It shows, you know, how many more rentals there are uh, versus hotels, right? So everything that is, you know, every country that is on the blue area, uh, basically have more rentals than hotel rooms here that are counted in the X axis. So basically France, Spain, Brazil, actually have more rentals than hotel inventory. So very large scale inventory already. So for those who think it's not so big, it's actually massive in terms, just in terms of supply. Um, you know, another misconception is that, you know, it is um, as a steady growth. So I'm going to look at the time and make sure that I'm, I'm on track, right? And basically uh, it's nothing, uh, you know, could be further away from static growth. As you can see here, you know, the amount of inventory has grown tremendously fast. There's actually 3.1 million bedrooms globally that has been added since 2018 to the total global portfolio of rentals, right? So it's the equivalent of Italy, France, Spain, and Germany coming together, uh, being available for rent uh, for travelers, right? So uh, it's not static at all. The inventory varies a lot and inside the markets as well. Um, some uh, misconception as well is around professionalization. A lot of people think that vacation rental is consumer to consumer, is the sharing economy. It's just, you know, someone renting out their own property when they're not using it or their, you know, their, main, their main property, their main house, their main apartments. Well, this is not true either. This shows you the share of the total amount of properties that are being rented that are managed by professional, which, uh, you know, have at least 50 properties. So in the US, 18% of the inventory is managed by super pros that have 50 properties or more. But you also have a lot of folks that have you know, between five and 50 or even two and 50 that do this professionally. So the inventory is highly professional and it's not really uh, the sharing economy that you know, or maybe the media or maybe the, the common uh, imagination thinks, right? Uh, and that's just an example here in Lisbon. I don't know if we have anyone from Portugal or Lisbon listening here, but basically this is just to show you some of the top 10 players uh, doing vacation rental in Lisbon. So you see, these are the number of, of listings that they have. It's many, many properties. They are like big ho decentralized hotels. And we have 16 pages of companies like that in Lisbon. And that's just an example. I can do that in any, any market. There's a lot of professional. So think about these guys as you know decentralized hotels, basically, or, or property managers. Uh, sometimes also we think this is not a very organized industry. Well, this is not true either. There are a lot of associations, a lot of uh, professional groups that are on Facebook, on WhatsApp, but also on, on official uh, associations. These are just a few of some of the, the ones that we work with. And I wanted to share uh, to show you that you know, it's a highly, highly, highly organized uh, industry that is actually easy to interact with because you, know, you can create the relationship with these associations. And I'll come back to that. Uh, sometimes also we could imagine that it's really not COVID safe to stay at people's home. Uh, versus a hotel that is very professional and that has our you know rules well. This is also proven to be untrue. And if you see, you know, this is just a screenshot taken out of uh, Airbnb's website to show you that you know they advertise the fact that you know there are um, you know healthy uh, and safe places to to stay at. So I've listed a few reasons why it's safe, but you know basically there are you know strong cleanliness and um, and disinfection guidelines that are shared to every host. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, self-checking technology that has been a lot, you know, much more than hotels. So actually a lot of properties already have uh, technology so they could just be self-checked. So you don't have to interact with nobody. Uh, there's a lot of keyless technology as well, where you can just connect with your phone, which also limit interaction because it means you don't have to, to go meet someone, exchange the keys, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of private space, you know, in a rental by definition. Uh, for instance, you know, you'd get your own kitchen, you'd get your own uh, set of amenities 
that allow you to be isolated and that by default, you know, in this context makes it very safe. And then there's also very limited common amenities, you know, unlike hotels who are constructed around, you know, the breakfast area, the lobby. Here, you know, you're basically in your own unit, which by default makes it, you know, extra safe. And the last point and uh, the mis uh, misconception that, you know, I think is very, very important is that the experience may be unpredictable. You know, like if you ask 10 years ago, travelers, why did they choose a hotel and not a rental? They would answer, I know what I get with a hotel. You know, it's a four star, it's a three star, it's a two star, it's a five star. I know what I get, you know. Um, with the rental, it can be unpredictable, right? Well, this is, you know, this has been solved uh, in great part thanks to the reviews, right? So Transparent tracks 227 million reviews in our database. Uh, and if you look into, um, you know, uh, actually reviews at property level, you know, right now we've got around 17 reviews just on Airbnb as an example per property. So imagine, you know, maybe it sounds not so much if you compare it to a whole hotel, but think that, you know, a property is an actual unit. It's attached to a particular key. So it's like if you were in a hotel, you're looking at 17 reviews for a specific room uh, that would speak about that specific room, you know, so room 205, you know, there is, um, you know, it's very nice. There's a special view. You can see the sea. Uh, the TV is great. Uh, you know, the carpet was a little bit, had some stain on it, uh, but, you know, everything was fantastic, you know. So this is very detailed to the room. While in rentals, this is how it works. You know, every single unit has its own reviews, which make it easy to validate the experience you're going to get because you can see what, you know, real travelers just like yourself, uh, you know, have had to say about that property and which, um, has makes a very, very powerful tool uh, for increasing conversion and for making the platform work, right? So very important. So with all that said, you know, I wanna discuss a little bit, how can you approach uh, rental analysis? And, and uh, we'll, I'll get at the end of why this is important. So when you look into rental, there are three main things you wanna look at. I'll summarize this in a minute. First is inventory, how big this is. You know, this is not like, you know, everything is registered and it's static. It changes a lot if there is an event, uh, you know, if your destination is growing, basically it's going to change. So you want to track it. You know, if, if you look at this, uh, sometimes I show this map and people say it looks like a virus spreading out. Uh, I don't really like this analogy, but it's actually shows, you know, how it can be spread out. And it's actually an advantage because it can help cater the needs of, of every traveler in the city. All right. So first thing is understanding supply, understanding how it varied over time. So this is an example again for Lisbon. You can see now that they're losing inventory, right? So 2021 here in blue is actually losing inventory, right? Uh, that's important to track and losing uh, travelers capacity. So now we're around 60,000 travelers can stay in rentals, whereas before we were at 90,000, right? Important to track this over time. Uh, the second thing is more demand oriented. You know, how is this, uh, you know, being consumed by travelers? How much are they paying for it, you know? So you can see AGRs in blue for this year are actually growing versus previous year. You can see here the impact of COVID on occupancy. So these are all, you know, metrics that are important to track. Obviously, uh, it's not like hotels. You need to track by category of property. So here I just made an example for one, two, three bedroom um, and the pricing and how this compares. And I think this is super important because you can see how, you know, a two bedroom is not double the price of a one bedroom, which makes it very competitive versus a hotel. Because if you're going with your family and your kids and you, you know, you need to host four or five people in a hotel. You need to take two or three rooms, uh, whereas in a rental, you just have to increase uh, one bedroom and it's not that much more expensive. So it's interesting to understand how these pricing scales for property type. And then also looking at forward looking demand and pricing. So here, this is an example of pacing in Lisbon. So you see New Year's Eve is already pacing a little bit. Uh, so understanding how this is being consumed is very important, um, not only in the past, but also in the future. Right. And finally, the last pillar would be traveler origin. So this is again in, in Lisbon or, or in Portugal. Uh, I can't remember exactly if this was uh, full, full, full Portugal, but basically you can see uh, how much domestic versus international demand there is in the destination. So in the high of COVID, it was mostly domestic and then now uh, international coming back. Right. And then you can break this down by country. Uh, what's important is to understand where our travelers coming from and also what type of properties they're consuming. So, you know, if you're bringing French people on your destination, are they renting out studio or are they renting out villas for eight people? You know, these things we can help understand, all right? 
Um, so there are three pillars, you know, that we just talked about. There is what we call supply, the inventory. Then there is demand, which is rate, ADR, and finally travelers' data. And these are the things that we can help um, understand. This is, by the way, the most kitsch slide uh, in the in the presentation. Um, all right. So just I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to wrap up. Basically, what you can do to to leverage rental, um, you know. Rent, rental, like Anna said, you know, there's higher lengths of stay. Uh, there's higher ADRs than before because demand has come back strongly for rentals. Occupancy is coming back. So all of these drives revenue, you know, longer stays, ADRs, et cetera, drives revenue. So what's important to do is track supply as soon as you can to understand, you know, how much and how big this is compared to the rest. Uh, track performance, report these KPIs, not only about tracking, but, you know, setting up simple reports so you can have a vision over time. And then track travelers to see if your marketing campaigns um, or if you see any interesting patterns in there makes sense. And finally, why not involve local players? I showed you there's a lot of associations. Uh, there's a lot of players on the ground. So these are some example of players, associations. So talk to them to make sure they're involved because they are part of their recovery and it's important to talk to them. And that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing and I hope I didn't go over time. That was perfect. Thank you so much, Pierre. Very, very interesting. So um, where, just so I, I, I caught on, so where did prices go in terms of short-term rental during COVID? Did they go up or down or, or what do you see developing there? Right. So the simple question is it, they went up. Okay. So um, basically we could have imagined that with loss of demand, you know, some people would be tempted to drop prices, but actually what happened is that, you know, uh, especially during summer and on, on holiday destinations, a rate went up because compression was very, very high, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this hides the fact that certain destination actually uh, lost demand and rates actually went down. So this is true, especially for, you know, urban destinations where rates went down uh, due to the lack of demand. But overall, you know, prices are up. I, I read, I think I saw Airbnb pointing towards a trend of multi-generational travel and bigger sort of rentals. Have you seen that from your days as well, that they're growing um for the bigger the full houses the multiple bedrooms right. and so is that a trend you can see right yeah i think that's right i think the 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 type of properties that work extra well are the properties that are you know almost an attraction themselves you know a reason by mm -hmm. themselves to travel you know when you go to an urban destination you need a place to stay maybe to eat to have your breakfast and then explore the city right mm -hmm. um in, 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 you know, what, what has worked really well are those properties that are not like that, that are reason for themselves to be there because they have a fantastic pool or a great view or great amenities, you know, or because they're in the countryside and they give you an escape from what happens. So these properties, they just, you know, worked extremely well and they tend to be bigger, right? And, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why bigger properties, you know, had higher, higher ADRs and grew faster than, than, than the rest. And also because, you know, that's the kind of travel that we have today. So would you say, in, in conclusion, do you, would you say that the city destinations that have short-term rentals are also more resilient in a time of crisis? Sure, yeah, I absolutely think so. Because, you know, at the end with the higher lengths of stay, you know, you, you just naturally tend to request more amenities. You know, you're not going to stay 10 days in a hotel with a mini fridge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to have spend, you know, 10 days uh, with your family having uh, lunch, dinner and breakfast outside. It's not going to work, right? So you need... You need a place where you can cook, you know, you can store a bit of food and you can, you know, go and explore the city. So lengths of stay went up, drives people naturally to rentals. So the pickup for rentals was faster, right? Obviously, with restrictions and limitation, some city demand has dropped. Some other has maintained pretty well. You know, I, I live in Madrid, for instance, and during the whole of the lockdown in Q4, Q1, we actually were the only city open and it was actually working pretty well. And I think that rentals... Uh, did benefit a lot from that. Um, and I think that we're on the front line for recovering and for answering what the trouble really need. <coughs> Excuse me. Brilliant. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. And I'm just going to, because I have Anna still here, and there's actually a question for Anna in the in the chat. So Anna, if you will just quickly join us again, then I'll start um, reading the question, which relates to if there is any analysis of the reviews, so the visitor experience within the research period that you um, presented from, and if yes, do you see any development in terms of reviews of visitor experience in comparison to the year before? 
Uh, we do this analysis, it's still not published. The review that we analyze that coming from TripAdvisor, from uh, one part, so everything what is related to the attractions and uh, um, tourism product, and also from another part, we analyze also the review of um, uh, holiday soccer, um, hotel soccer, so the satisfaction level with the hotels offer the destination. We are working on that and we are going to publish every two uh, or three weeks, somebody didn't decide it exactly, uh, the time period, we're going to publish uh, the new insight related to this issue, to the change in the behavioral patterns of the travelers. So um, yeah, just uh, yeah. <laughs> reach follow out for more. more. Yeah. <laughs> And our uh, social media account all the time uh, publish new study. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So thank you both, Pierre and Anna, for joining us and sharing your insights and all your interesting data. Um, and so now we've seen data on behavior, on booking patterns and consumptions, short-term rentals. And we're, we're now in for, a, I would say, a special treat because we are going for a horizon. So we're going to take a little break from our faster class, um, diving into a horizon where we have a special edition of St. Elmo's Trend Radar. And it's especially, and it's an edition that is especially for tourism and for us, basically. Um, what are the trends on the radar um, and how do they inform what we should do next? So Martin Schobert, who is a brand experience designer and managing partner with St. Elmo's uh, Tourismus Marketing, will take us through uh, this uh, 2021 trend radar based on their unique meta trend research methodology. So Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi. So hello, everybody. <clears throat> Martin uh, from St. Elmo's Tourismus Marketing. Uh, I just want you uh, give some perspectives uh, for the future of trends. The thing is what we did the last um, couple of months, we did something uh, unusual. We just uh, didn't uh, take one or a second or a third uh, trend um, uh, analysis. Uh, we uh, uh, thought uh, as we love trends, uh, there must be another way to screen them, to uh, uh, get the most uh, out of them all together. And uh, therefore we started something like a meta trend research. And uh, what I want to introduce to you today is uh, the results of this meta trend research. Um, so what we did uh, with this meta search was we uh, 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 screened around 50 plus international trend forecasts and expertises, uh, mainly outside of the tourism, uh, mainly trends in marketing, in media, in technology. We screened them and evaluated them uh, due to their relevance for tourism. And we clustered it uh, uh, in the form of a tourism edition uh, of this trend uh, rada, we call it. And uh, the last thing we did, we prioritized uh, these uh, trends. Uh, if they are urgent for the tourism industry, if we should watch it, or if there is no urge uh, to follow this. And uh, this is what I show you today. Uh, so uh, another uh, interesting fact is that this uh, wasn't just, uh, uh, we started last year. Uh, this is an ongoing process. Our colleagues from the uh, media plan uh, company, a sister company from, from us in the service plan network, uh, uh, where we are belong to, uh, they uh, started uh, in 2017 uh, to screen these uh, trends as a, a meta search, uh, trend research. And uh, as you can see, these were the, were the main important trends during the last years. And uh, so on the right hand side, these are the most impressive um, developments we identified currently there. So I will, uh, in the following, go deeper into this uh, 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 insight. Uh, what's really interesting, and this is the main message I have to you today, uh, 
although we scanned tech um, uh, trend studies and marketing trend studies, normally you would be supposed that uh, they are tech focused, but they are also very social uh, focused and there is a shift to the social engagement uh, recognizable so this is a very interesting fact so this is the so-called trend radar yeah as you can see it's a, a very uh, easy summary of uh, uh, the work uh, of uh, really a lot of uh, trend studies we uh, identified uh, uh, in these trends um, five main fields of action. Uh, so what I want to uh, introduce you later on is uh, these uh, fields of action in detail. And what we then did, as I mentioned before, we, we, we developed a tourism filter. And as you can see, these 10, uh, we think that these 10 are the most important ones. Uh, uh, sorry, not for the tourism filter. We first, we developed a... Uh, a corona filter. Uh, this means which of these trends are very important during corona. So this is uh, what you can see here. And then we developed a tourism filter. And these are the trends which are uh, very important when it comes to tourism. So, but they are trends outside the tourism industry. And we, we uh, identified the relevance for, for us in the tourism sector. Uh, and therefore, this is a very good uh, 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 insight, I think so. Uh, uh, from outside the industry. So uh, when it comes to the details, is, uh, as I mentioned before, the social engagement shows that there's a huge trend towards purpose. So people love to decide what uh, what they shall do. Uh, they, uh, they don't want just to um, uh, uh, buy things, consume things uh, just for the consuming. There must be a, a real uh, meaningful purpose in behind. And as you can see, the green uh, 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 mentioned uh, uh, trends are the most important trends we think for uh, tourism. So new work or pleasure. Uh, business and leisure combination. These are uh, very interesting, uh, uh, a very interesting trend we uh, uh, have really to follow in the product development. Clean food uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, food become huge important. New ways of uh, uh, consuming food uh, 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 explored, and therefore um, uh, another tr uh, trend which is high relevant for us is green pressure and also. Uh, trust was during the pandemic huge important but what what's very interesting are the the two here at the uh, 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 in the middle yogo and yomo joy of going out or joy of missing out they come from the composite uh, for from the trend of fear of missing out which uh, recognized in 2016 uh, and we, which was added to the oxford english dictionary uh, uh, a couple of years ago uh, and the fear of missing out uh, uh, goes in combination very close uh, especially during the pandemic with the fear of going out yeah so uh, uh, this was a trend during the last two years what we now see is that there is a new development the joy of going out and this is highly relevant uh, for us in tourism and the joy of missing out not to have to do everything yeah? so these are two very interesting trends i just want to point out to show you that uh, we should deal about this and which we should think how to develop new product products in this field the second uh, field of actions are the super user. And we identified here another very important super user. It's the employee. The employee becomes more and more important than uh, the last years. Uh, currently, we say it's more important to make marketing for good employees because uh, uh, we don't find uh, uh, experts in tourism and also we don't find seasonal workers. So uh, there are a lot of uh, trends uh, to identify. Uh, for example, joint HR managers uh, uh, in the tourism industry for, for a couple of uh, tourism uh, 
uh, organizations together. They do one HR management for a couple of hotels, for example, or uh, getting 38 or 40 hours work week also uh, when it comes uh, 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 for employees in the hotel hospitality business uh, and holidays at holidays. So uh, this was uh, nearly impossible during the last years. All these are new developments we can see uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to um, new work of tourism employees. And also there are a lot of new products like pleasure uh, I mentioned before, uh, uh, the, the hotel, not the home office, the hotel office, co-workation are big trends. Uh, for example, here, uh, Swiss Tourism, they developed the product Bed and Bureau, uh, which means that you get uh, one additional night to, uh, if you stay on the weekend, you get the Monday for free and you can do your, your office work there. Uh, another thing is uh, here, uh, co-working spaces are coming up more and more. Here's one from the Tyrol in the rural area, but uh, they are also uh, coming up very uh, intensive in the, in the uh, uh, urban areas currently. And they look like this, you know, uh, uh, they are uh, co-living and co-working uh, uh, comes together, and uh, this uh, is uh, a social uh, um, a social development which is very interesting. They say uh, they they mention itself it's the best community retreat uh, uh, in the Alps. So there's a, a huge development. Uh, there are a lot of products. Uh, 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 we, which are established currently. The, uh, the third uh, uh, field of actions is the private personalization. And I point out one uh, uh, example here, the data storytelling. Uh, there's a new era of data-driven creativity. Uh, Advertising Week uh, wrote uh, recently. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is also uh, already reality. You know, here's a, a fitness center where... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, you see that the result of doing sports can be seen here uh, uh, through a data visualization. The European Union invests uh, two million of uh, money in um, uh, funding uh, data innovation hubs, and uh, 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 currently dashboards are rising more and more. Tourism dashboards, like here the UNWTO tourism dashboard, but also uh, uh, locally dashboards dashboards become more and more important uh, where all the uh, data uh, can be measured at one place. And uh, then the fourth field of action is the platform economy. Uh, there are a couple of trends. Uh, there are new digital marketing places uh, which become more and more uh, important for um, uh, tourism marketing. We know the activity booking engines and uh, uh, um, other uh, uh, voucher systems become more and more important. But what's interesting, there come uh, there come up more and more new platforms. Uh, so uh, new platforms like this here, it's fans, for example. Uh, you uh, uh, surely know the uh, founders of uh, Trust You. They uh, sold their company uh, a couple of uh, months ago and uh, founded a new uh, startup. It's called Fans. Uh, what's uh, in behind is that there's a loyalty sy system and it's a new platform where uh, people who travel to destination can uh, 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 gain uh, loyalty points which each payment they do uh, and they got, got really cashback. Yeah? So this is the first cashback system prepared mainly for DMOs. Very interesting. Uh, uh, and uh, they combine the payment and loyalty. They want to increase frequency and spending. So very interesting uh, topic. And the fifth field of action we identified is the content experience. So quality content is absolutely key in many uh, in nearly each uh, trend uh, report we we screened. So uh, uh, quality content means uh, 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 the right content at the right uh, situation, like we uh, see here uh, on this innovative uh, uh, 
uh, mountain uh, uh, gondola uh, here. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, real-time data uh, uh, put on the screens, on the windows of the gondola. So very interesting uh, that uh, the right content at uh, different places uh, could be transported. Or you can see here uh, that uh, uh, the hotel area is used by content, creative content, uh, uh, and also content uh, uh, in the landscape area uh, uh, gets new uh, uh, ways and and like here content is used for entertainment currently in many many cases or, or uh, uh, different ways of using content could be seen here like uh, these water uh, water walls uh, which uh, uh, uses some messages also there so well if you say, well, okay, uh, very quickly, very interesting trends, but if you ask now, what are, what is the real important takeaways for you in the European cities, what would I suggest, what is the most important thing? It's that there is um, uh, coming up a new type of visitor. It's uh, the so-called promat. Uh, Progressive nomads. Um, the Design Hotel uh, recently did a study last year, a trend study with the Future Laboratory, and they uh, identified the Promat as a pan generational, conceptually driven traveler, guided by the idea that travel should be proactive, purposeful, and uh, foster a sense of personal progress. They uh, uh, travel with low carbon footprint and a digital minded lifestyle is absolutely key for them. So what's what's so important and what's uh, what's different and what uh, is is important that we change when we 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 plan our marketing and communication. We have to recognize that it's not more about where to go and what to do for them. It's more about we shall answer in our communication and we shall provide products which answer a real uh, uh, the question of why shall they travel and how shall they travel. And this is, I think, uh, the most important message I have to you. Uh, follow these new uh, progressive nomads and uh, think about the why and the how uh, traveling to your destination. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you are cu curious to, deep, uh, a bit, uh, to dive a bit deeper, so uh, we will be there next week on Friday, 24 at the virtual rooftop bar. I'm really happy to see you there. Thank you very much to listen. Thank you, Martin. That was very, very interesting. Promads and loyalty schemes and data storytelling. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, and thank you also for highlighting the rooftop next week. I'm sure we'll have interesting discussions there. Um, I, I think I'm just going to, um, if you can stay in the room uh, and then we'll see if there are any questions that come up. But then in the meantime, I'm going to jump to our other speaker of this session, Emmanuel uh, Tullier of MKG Consulting, because now we're sort of going from, we've seen all the data on behavior and insights. Now we have uh, Martin's uh, big trend radar of all the stuff that's happening out there that we sort of need to start grasping at. And Emmanuel is going to share her insights and the research they've done on how European cities and DMOs are adapting to all these changes, the crisis and everything that's happening. In partnership with ECM, they've interviewed several European cities about their view of the future and how they're dealing with this new normal, or at least what they perceive as the new normal. So Emmanuel, please, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Signa. So it is a real pleasure to talk to you this afternoon and it is important to us to share with you a few insights. Uh, Martin told you a lot of things that uh, really complement what I'm going to share with you. I just wanted to give you a quick look back, a really fast look back on the, these big trains that are in tourism. We all know uh, that Europe and the world have already suffered several big crises, though this one is the biggest. But what we want to uh, highlight here is that every time the tourism economy went back and went back stronger. So we have to stay optimistic on the next month and years. One interesting though, interesting thing though, is that the luxury and the upscale segment that you see in pink in pink curve is the one suffering the most. And it's the one that is the more 
uh, visible and available in uh, European cities. So that's something you, you have to take care of and to be aware of. Then let's be a little bit optimistic. We see that 2021 is much more better than 2020, which is in pink. And we are slowly recovering and we are going to catch back the yellow curve, which was 2019. It was a really good year in Europe. France is going to recover faster and bigger because of its big domestic market and the wide or the variety of offer it has uh, in, its, in, uh, in its country. Last thing I wanted to put, just to put the picture and to put the frame is that European cities suffered a lot uh, during the crisis because they couldn't rely on the international customers and neither on the MICE customers. So now let's jump to the other part of our presentation, which is, is there a new normal? But are we sure there is going to be a new normal? Because tourism we know and Moreover, in cities, it's about being attractive, but respecting the balance to keep a qu good quality of life, to avoid pollution issue, to give a big vari variety of activities to inhabitants and tourists, take care of transport, and more of everything, the most important is keeping control of the purpose. We are going to talk about that a little bit later. So is there a new normal and will these trends last? Because we know that at every crisis, this is a, but a pattern everyone follows is to turn back to what is the most important to him, family, friends, spending time, relaxing, focusing on yourself, but is it going to last? And can city offer sustainable tourism? Is it possible for a city to offer real sustainable tourism? These are some of the topics we've talked about with you when we interviewed you uh, before the summer. In order to have a really good uh, recovery, we need three conditions to be together. Uh, having good sanitary rules. We have it now, we have vaccines, we have uh, information with the travel condition, for instance, with the vaccine pass. The return to mobility, we almost have it because international travel is still difficult and the return to consumption. We know that people want to, to spend money, to spend good time. Martin told us they want to have meaning and experiences in the way they travel, but there are still restriction. This one, I'm going to go really fast on this one because Martin already talked to you about it. What is important to our point of view is that those new type of tourists who are working from home, but also can travel and work and spend several months in a destination are people who hard to be taken in, into account when you, when you program your destination, when you talk to your stakeholders and you have to give them offers that can answer their needs. Martin also told you about the way people now want to, to use their money to spend their time. They not only want to own things, but they want to live experience. So this is also very important in the way you design uh, tourism services and products. So what we've been talking together with you uh, guys when we interviewed before uh, summer is first of all, the mice and business traveler. Uh, Madrid told us we want to stay an important mice destination, but not at any cost. Though they've made a promotion campaign to the British market, the French and the German market, they also want to be their mice welcoming sustainable. So they've been working on a guide for hotels, restaurants, conference centers, DMCs, and, and everyone who is uh, in charge of uh, mice welcoming to help them be more sustainable in the way they produce uh, their, their activity. For Lausanne, mice is 74% of the tourists that are present in the destination. So they've, they've taken the 2020 year to develop new tools and a new website, for instance, uh, a venue finder to help people to, to travel easily in the destination. And they have developed virtual and hybrid events to answer the needs. So mice is still a priority for Lausanne, for Madrid, also for Brussels, who wants to welcome more congresses, but also wants to welcome them differently. They want to guide the MICE customers to a more cultural offer, 
relying on the inhabitants as ambassadors of the city. So the MICE activity is really a key one for European cities because those, those travelers spend more money and uh, tend to stay in a period uh, that are not the same as leisure tourism. Another trend we've been talking together is less tourism is better tourism. Several of you told us you want to target new audiences. You want to stop communication, communication towards distant customers because to you it's not sustainable to, uh, to welcome buses of Chinese people, for instance. We know they are going to come. We cannot prevent them from visiting the Eiffel Tower or Trafalgar Square or La Sagrada Familia, but we really want to focus on more qualitative uh, targets. We have also to spread the frequentation within the destination. Paris, for instance, wants to develop alternative offers also to strengthen the link with the local tourists. Amsterdam, during the, the international border closing, realized that some neighborhood of the city were completely empty at night. And they really want to redesign the city for its inhabitants or for a balanced tourism with restaurants, but also uh, uh, local uh, shops and so on, not only uh, international brands and offices and so on. They, re they really want to redesign the city. This is going to be a long work, but they are willing to do it. Another way to do better tourism too, is the way people are moving into the city. So each city wants to develop cycling, walking, a new way of visiting the city. And for instance, Dublin wants to become a low carbon destination within the few years. So everyone has really strong targets on those topic of better tourism. A third uh, trend we've been talking to together is the locals. Of course, during the lockdown and the closing of the borders last year, Destination had no choices but to turn to their local uh, inhabitants. Madrid, for instance, started a new campaign they call Madrileña to invite their inhabitants to rediscover the city, to use services that are usually made for the tourists, such as hotel, restaurants, tabla o flamenco, and so on. Lausanne also worked with the local as ambassadors to help welcoming the, the visitor to make them discover the city differently. And they are using, for instance, their reward, the, the reward they had in 2019 as best leader city in the world to attract German speaking Swiss people within the destination. In Brussels, for instance, there, there are now the Cuckoo Brussels, which are tourism information boards, but also open in bars. And that made a campaign which, is, which was called No Brussels Without Us. And it's not about iconic monument or building, but it's about inhabitants, which is really to them a lever to attract people in the city. It's been more difficult, it's been more difficult for Dublin to attract local customers because they usually receive British or American customers, but they really want to work with the inhabitants to welcome differently the customers that are going to come back uh, within the destination. What we all talked about with every destination is the way you manage to work with the stakeholders of your territories hotel, restaurants, conference centers, uh, leisure, uh, tour operators, and so on, all were, the, were suffering a lot. So many of you help them by financing, financing them sometimes, training, giving information, keep the link. For instance, in Brussels, they were seeing each other every month. And it is really important to our point of view because we MKG Consulting are working with the tourism stakeholders. They are in need, they are in demand of keeping that link with the DMOs, spend time together, think together, share ideas. It is really important and it's a good lever to better the, the welcoming of your destination. So now what you shared with us, with us about the future you want for your destination, for your European cities. First of all is avoid over tourism. Developing offers that can 
drive the tourists in other places that the center of the city, though you cannot prevent uh, tourists to, from going to the, the Eiffel Tower or having a look at uh, Buckingham Palace, but you can offer an alternative uh, way of discovering the city. You've already told, you've also told us that you want to target new clientele and you are working really strongly on segmentation. This, your segmentation has, are becoming more and more precise. For instance, Madrid is targeting upscale and luxury clientele because you, you are going to have a lot of opening of restaurants and hotels that are upscale. You also want to target senior customers who are enthusiasts about cultural and gastronomy offers. Lausanne is willing to develop the family targets. They've made a travel book, for instance, for young people. Also, Odessa also is willing to develop this family targets. So you want to have more added values with your customers to know them better. And that's also a few word works you are going, you are doing in your destination. The other point is becoming a digital destination. You took profit of that moment when ev where everything was stopped to develop new tools. Madrid, for instance, developed friendly, mobile friendly office and an app that is called Imagine Madrid that allows you to visit the city uh, from your smartphone. Uh, visit Brussels did a new website to help the partners on, uh, on uh, uh, discovering the destination better and they help the partners on the topic on that topic and one important target for every of you objective for every of you is to keep the tourist longer in the destination not only for one or two nights but for more nights if possible for instance Lausanne is working on a way to promote itself like a hub for other touristic destinations that are nearby and the way people working at the welcoming office is changing is that they are not now expect, expected to be able to share their love of the destination, to share secret, secret places, and not only give information to the tourists that push the door of a tourist office. What is really, what really striked us when we talked to several of you, and when we took the time to talk to you, and it was very interesting, and thank you for that, is that all the trends you share with us, you shared with us, we, you were already working on it before the crisis. You already started to develop sustainable tourism. You already started on the digital tools. You already started to reposition the, the, the customers you want to target. So to come back to the new normal, I think it's going just going to be a, better normal maybe and the COVID crisis allowed you to accelerate the, the trends and the, the strategy you already had put together to for the next years. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, do not hesitate. I'm here for you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was very interesting and also a great segue between our sort of our first uh, hour or so and our second hour or so. And I think just understanding the what you've also been discussing with the DMOs and the destinations around the need to look for new customers, the desire to have a closer contact really, as you were also saying, not be so distanced. Um, dispersal, going more digital. Um, I think there are lots of interesting topics and also actually relates to some of the trends that Martin were talking about around the promats and the sort of the loyalty schemes and so on. There's lots of links there. So I want to thank you both. We are actually going to continue. I don't have any questions, but I do want to say also to our attendees, our participants out there listening in, do write your questions in the Q&A. I am keeping a very open eye out for any questions as we go along, or if there's anything that triggers your curiosity or attention and you want the speakers to dive deeper into, just let us know. Uh, we have some very insightful uh, speakers here and they can go in pretty much any direction that you uh, ask them to. So, but for now, thank you, Emmanuel, and thank you, Martin, for being here. Um, and we're actually going into our final faster class session of the day. 
And what we're doing now is we're shifting a little bit our focus, also based on some of the things that Emmanuel was talking about, um, where we're going to now shift to, okay, if this is what it looks like, if this is what's happening, what should we be doing? Um, and where should we uh, sort of focus our activities and our priorities? So uh, joining us from early morning Toronto is now uh, Dan Halawak, co-founder and CEO of Crowdriff. Um, and Crowdriff, as you know, works with tourism and travel brands all over the world with their unique visual marketing software. And Dan, we're ready for your faster class in the future of more and better visual storytelling. Hi, Dan. Hi, Sina. Good afternoon. It is so great to be here with everybody for this is not a tourism conference conference. I hope you've been having an incredibly uh, valuable and exciting day so far with everybody connecting and sharing ideas. Perfect. So again, I'm Dan Holowak. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Crowdriff. And at Crowdriff, we have the privilege of working with several fantastic partners across Europe. And uh, I'm just really excited to be here um, to talk with everybody here today. So today it's about how visual storytelling is the future of how we're going to be engaging with travelers and working in partnership with locals and with our communities. So let's start off by looking at what is visual storytelling? Well, put simply, it's about showing, not telling. Showing, not telling. So don't tell me your destination is safe. Show me. Don't tell me your destination is welcoming. Show me. Don't tell me that you're family friendly. Show me. You get the idea. Don't tell me that the coast of Portugal has some fantastic surf spots. Show me. Um, with this story that I, I discovered recently and opened my eyes to the surfing potential um, and, and experiences in Portugal. Show me in a way that is authentic, that is accurate, and that allows you to remain agile as a destination. So visual storytelling is in and of itself authentic because you're telling a real story that happened to a local, to a traveler from somebody's perspective. It makes it authentic, helps to connect with the audience. It's accurate. It's a lot easier for somebody to misinterpret what you say or what you write than to misinterpret what they are seeing. It allows them to accurately understand the message that you're sharing with them really quickly. And if you build your storytelling system together with partners, it helps you remain really agile and you can be nimble and adapt to change as change inevitably comes. So maybe just take a second and think for yourself, you know, in your own marketing channels, are you taking a really visual approach? Are the visuals that you're sharing and the stories that you're telling visually, are they authentic? Are they accurate? Are they helping you remain agile? Now, this would not be a, a fast class on, on visual storytelling if we didn't jump into a series of examples that will leave you inspired about all the different ways that you can leverage visual storytelling for the future of how you are connecting and sharing your destination. So how does visual storytelling help destinations stay nimble? Well, let's go through a couple of fast hitting examples together. So let's go back to COVID-19 hits the world and destinations that are leveraging visual storytelling are quickly showing locals and nearby visitors that it's safe to come visit. They are surfacing great local content around how locals are exploring safely, how locals are wearing masks. And this immediately gives a visitor an idea of what it's like in that destination and that they are putting safety first. And as things start to gradually reopen every day on social media, more locals and nearby visitors were sharing experiences that they were doing safely. That was outdoor hikes, bike rides, time with their pet, time with their family. And it immediately gives you an idea of things that are becoming available and how real people are engaging in those things right now that builds trust and confidence with travelers. Or take a look at Limerick, who has done a fantastic job as dining has reopened and remained really agile with visual storytelling. So with outdoor dining, instead of just telling people patios are open or various um, dining experiences are now available, they are showing it. I mean, check out some of these beautiful experiences like enjoying a meal at a picnic bench, or just sitting and having a mini picnic across this beautiful green lawn here. And with a quick call to action from that visual story, you can jump right into a partner website, place an order for a burger at this gastro pub, 
or just keep browsing through what's available. They've got super inviting um, patios, just you know, so inviting to come back and uh, and enjoy. They've got locals and nearby uh, visitors that are are welcoming uh, welcoming folks. Photos that are making me making me hungry, even though it's just breakfast <laughs> here here in Toronto, um, and just doing a fantastic job sharing what is available through visuals. Now, outdoor experiences are, of course, extremely important. And destinations have been pivoting really quickly to share those stories, like how Luxembourg has been sharing the outdoor excursions that are available. So I love how Luxembourg has used visual stories to share outdoor experiences with their experience Luxembourg through our stories and also through visual storytelling across their website, like some of these visuals that you see right here. You've got some fantastic hiking opportunities and they've included quick access to information about that trail and how to access the trail. It really gives you a picture of the now, what is happening now in the destination through the eyes of real people, real stories. I would love to experience this camping glamping experience actually that I, I just uncovered from, uh, from some of their uh, visual stories. Now, you have to also convey a lot of important information as a destination. That might be around responsible travel, around COVID-19 safety, and it's easy to put these things into PDFs or into long form pages on your website. Um, that was how Golden uh, Destination Golden uh, started with this, was with these PDFs. But are travelers reading all these PDFs? Probably not. So they use visual storytelling and they made visuals about eight tips for responsible camping, responsible hiking, responsible biking. And now with a couple of taps, your potential visitor is just tapping through a story around how to have responsible hikes in your destination, like hiking on designated trails. Take your garbage with you. And with a simple swipe up, they can provide extra tips on why it's so important to take things with you um, on your hikes. Making sure that that traveler is in harmony with the local environment, nature, local communities, and respecting the destination. And one of my absolute favorite stories is, of course, how destinations are working with locals to remain agile. Your locals tell great stories. I love this story uh, about, about Tartu, Estonia, shared through the eyes of Sandra. So let's just hop in and, uh, and experience part of the story together. Hi, I'm Sandra, and today I'm going to explore Tartu. So come with me and let's start. This is the most famous statue in Tartu, and it's called the Kissing Students because Tartu is a university city. And this is... And with a simple swipe up, you're able to see a map. You can click on that link in the map. We can jump right to Tartu Town Square so we know exactly where it is, grab walking directions to that kissing student statue, and then easily come back and continue with Sanders. Town Hall Square with cozy little cafes and good-looking architecture. Tartu is a bohemian university city and the most convenient way to get around here is with a bike. So I have arrived at the top. The ship was built in 2006, but it was built with medieval techniques. So that's why it's special and that's why it's one of a kind in the world. So these are Frith and Kolla and they can take you on a trip down Emayagi or to the biggest lakes of Estonia. And I thought this was pretty cool. So I swiped up and realized that you can join a regular boat ride or you can rent that really amazing medieval style boat for your, your family or a group that you're traveling with. Sandra and the team at Tartu just did a great job sharing a compelling story together with a local. And Google rewards visual storytelling. More and more, we are seeing visual stories that are showing up on Google Search and Google Discover. This means that Google is helping your visual stories reach travelers where they are based on what they're looking for. As Google sees what people are searching for and sees how they're engaging with all Google products so that they can put stories front and center so the visual stories are finding the right travelers at the right time. So 
I want to leave you with two thoughts after all of those examples. First is, does your website use visual uh, visuals for compelling storytelling? Or are the visuals on your website just pretty, just window dressing? Think about, are, do the visuals on your website, are they telling the story or are they supporting the story? It's important with visual storytelling that they are telling the story directly to, uh, to the traveler. And as a bonus, I think this is incredibly important. Are you partnering with locals to adapt quickly and to stay relevant? Your locals are the heartbeat of your destination. They're on the ground. They know what's new. They know what's safe. And working together with locals allow you to stay incredibly nimble. And we've seen that time and time again with, um, with how destinations have been, uh, been really agile through the changes through this pandemic. So I'll stop there. Um, hope you've enjoyed these examples. Again, I'm, I'm Dan and uh, my contact information is there if you'd like to reach out and chat more. Thank you, Dan. Uh, that was very interesting. A, a quick question also based on your last point here about locals is that I was just thinking like, oh, is this has this grown throughout the pandemic crisis? And I'm just wondering if you have examples of destinations that have introduced new content corporation or collaboration with locals throughout the pandemic and sort of continuing with that onwards. Yeah, they, they absolutely have. Um, we've seen the destination, I think the the pandemic forced destinations to, to kind of really focus inward on the destination and on the health of the destination and local businesses. Through that, destinations re rekindled that connection with their local DNA and with local, um, local communities. And so we've seen more and more destinations develop um, often what they refer to as like an ambassador program of a connection with locals in different communities that they can rely on to help share photos, videos, um, produce a short story about a great local business, um, and I think that is one of the uh, most incredibly, you know, valuable, long-lasting changes that I'm seeing um, uh, through this pandemic that remain that helps destinations stay really strong and agile um, together with their community, and it will create just a better future for for the industry. I think. That's, I think that's quite exciting. I, I have one question in the in the Q and A as well, which is uh, firstly thanking you for a very professional presentation. Uh, real people, real stories. Um, all authentic and creative, but also saying there is that sense of, you know, sea of sameness. It's the pizzas, the cafe lattes, the sunsets mm -hmm. and so on. Um, how, how do you avoid that? How do you work with that? Well, each destination is, uh, I guess each person takes away something different from what they're seeing with your visuals. So um, your destination is naturally different if you look at it through the eyes of how your locals are experiencing it. And so... Um, we see destinations focus on, you know, how our, um, you know, you have your key categories, but if you are working together with your, with your locals and you're looking at things through the eyes of, of what they love about the destination, I think if you start there, mm. that's the best way to avoid the sea of sameness because we've seen the trends of um, everybody is the microbrewery city. You know, e every city has the brewery tour. Every city has the vineyard tour. Um, if, but if you were by working with your locals and viewing, like starting first with your people and then expanding out from, from your people to, to their stories and their content, mm -hmm. I think that gives you the greatest advantage and opportunity to, uh, to differentiate the story that you're telling. Yeah, so it's the eye of the local beholder, I guess. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, brilliant. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, we're still in our faster class mode, so I'm going to... Uh, jump on to our next speaker. Um, but then if you can stay on for this session, then maybe we'll have questions uh, at the end for you. Uh, and so um, for our final uh, faster class session of the day, we are going to reimagine a future of corporative destination marketing, which basically also entails a future of new kinds of funding and new partnerships for destinations. So Luca Romozzi, tell us more about this future. Luca is joining us. He's Senior Commercial Director of Tourism with Sojourn. Luca, Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi, Signe. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, inviting me. I'm really excited now to show you my presentation. So thanks, thanks Signe, for the introduction. I am Luca Romozzi, for those who know me, I'm the senior director responsible for the destination team in Europe at Sojourn. Um, so today, in this not tourist conference, I'll try to give some ideas of reimagining the cooperative future 
of destination marketing. I'll try to explain a little bit more what I what I mean. I'll do just one slide about Sojourn for if anyone that uh, is listening right now and doesn't know about us, Sojourn is the travel marketing platform. So what we do, uh, we empower travel marketers to move travelers from dreaming to your destination. And we do it thanks to real-time data and new technology in marketing, like artificial intelligence applied in uh, digital marketing. So th the way that it works is that we uh, acquire every second signal from hundreds of data partners. So it means uh, what their customers are doing on their site, on their app. And this is where our technology learns and understand who is the right traveler at the right moment for our clients that are using the, the platform. So the clients uh, are um, in 2021, 20, we are at 10,000 clients. And if you think about it, 85% are small and medium business that they want to make sure that they drive traffic to their site. However, 50% of the investment are actually uh, coming from this nation like you. So this is a little bit of uh, who we are, but I want to focus on you. I want to focus on uh, destination marketers. So uh, we know that uh, destination markets are facing common challenges, even uh, in this ever-changing um, scenario. So the one is for sure understanding how to drive visitation in a sustainable way for the future. At the same time is how to, the, the usual, right, uh, the right travelers, right channel, right time, and also measuring impact to make sure that uh, the, there is a proof return investment. So uh, to give an answer on one bright area or uh, one uh, approach, I think uh, I want to use the quote from our friend, Luca Martinazzoli, uh, the CEO from Milan and, uh, and Partners, where he said, we believe strongly that this moment is showing everyone how important it is to work together to promote a destination. It's a moment where there are less resources and you need to be more precise and potentially you need to be very fast. So it's important to stay close to the partners, to the stakeholders, uh, to work together. And this is how I think, this is one idea that I would like to develop today on terms of what does it mean when a destination wants to promote together to their uh, stakeholder? This is called co-op marketing. And co-op marketing is not new, like this conference is not a tourism uh, co conference, but the, what we need to think is that while it's not new, technology can allow to use it in a different way. So the traditional co-op uh, was effectively a DMO that might invite some partners, for example, to share the cost of a newspaper ad and then uh, allocate based on the investment uh, visibility to their partners. This traditional approach is obviously too uh, in, is inflexible. It's hard to share insights and learnings because it's more static and it's impossible to allow the tourist board that is using this tool, the co-op marketing, to calculate the exact economic impact. That's why we are in the era of digital and, um, and this is, but when you think about co-op in digital, it becomes really, really interesting because first of all, the, it means that you can uh, have an approach uh, with a tourist in the center. So customer centric, um, you can have more flexibility on a budget on all sites for the partners. Uh, the DMO that is promoting this co-op marketing has, can have an holistic view and also Thanks to data, you can aggregate the economic impact. And so that will help to understand what uh, those funds are actually producing into the destination. That's why it's not new, but definitely we should see it with different eyes. So, and especially we are at Sojourn strong believers that a digital co-op can be one of the tools, if the tool for the recovery. It's a little bit putting back together the band. And when we're talking about the band, it's the DMO band. So think about your DMO and here, you know, from a city point of view, obviously you do have your partners, your hotels, your travel SME, but obviously this model can also work 
from a regional point of view that is inviting their local DMO, like cities. So think about as a very flexible way to uh, manage the co-op based on your objective. But what the co-op does enab enable you to get more for every investment, every euro invested, and support fast recovery. So I try to be very pragmatic here. So what, what does it mean? Let's say that you have a DMO that wants uh, to dedicate a part of their fund, their investment, uh, in a co-op program. So what could, uh, would happen is that the uh, DMO okay, can invite the local DMOs, if it's a regional one, or a city tourist board can, uh, uh, DMO can uh, uh, invite the hotels and, and, uh, and, and the small and medium business, what they do, they come with their own investment that can be relatively small. However, the, the, they will benefit, first of all, of the match of the DMO uh, found, and this is what the co-op can uh, um, immediately show the, the impact of working together. And at the same time, uh, our program will also incentivize to work together. And so you have also another benefit from Sojourn to have uh, even uh, more funds for your campaign. So you can see that here, we uh, prioritize the individual campaigns, but at the same time, we're doing together. We're doing as a team, as a band, uh, that wants to achieve the same objective. So imagine that uh, you, as a, as a DMO host, effectively, you can have access and you can have uh, access to a, a portal that tells you exactly what uh, um, the, the, the overall co-op is producing in terms of searches, bookings, and each partner uh, campaign. So in a way, it's an holistic view for the DMO promoter, the DMO host, but at the same time, each participant, so your stakeholder, can actually have access to their own single campaign. So as you can see, it's um, a cooperative way to do destination marketing. So I came here uh, today with an example. Uh, it's a region, so it's not a city. However, it gives you also the idea on how uh, it can work from a regional point of view or just steal the model and put it in, the, in a, a city uh, approach. So it, in this case, I'm gonna bring the example of Fjord Norway. So Fjord Norway, effectively wanted to do a uh, multi-channel campaign and having an approach full funnel. So first of all, we prioritize their DMO brand campaign. So they're, they're invested in a video, in the display Facebook. So, um, and again, trying to have a, a storytelling across multiple channels. This is a standard way that, a, that a, a tourist board should work in terms of promoting their destination. However, Part of the strategy was also to invest in a co-op. And the co-op effectively completed the funnel because uh, while the top funnel was driving traffic to the website, engaging people with videos, native, and uh, all the great content that they have, at the same time, when we identified people ready to book, we weren't tra uh, driving traffic to the uh, fewer Norway site, but to the partner site. So uh, here you have two partners. One was a uh, regional hotels, classic Norway hotels, and the other was a fjord uh, tour. So it, it's a small and medium business uh, promoting tour in Norway. So you can see and that, uh, first of all, you can capture full funnel. You can have a full funnel strategy, but at the same time, Fjord Norway, as a host of the overall program, can track the impact of their own campaign and their co-op campaigns. And without saying, the partners are really happy to see traffic and bookings coming to their site. So the message that I want to give is that if we work as an ecosystem and if we work uh, with uh, working on our strength as a destination, not only isolating the DMO, the future is bright. The future is bright. So digital co-op marketing provides travel marketers more value. It's scalable efficient, it's easier to test. So I would definitely um, give this, uh, have this opportunity to, to tell everyone to at least think for the future, how co-op marketing could change your future strategy for a more sustainable way to do destination marketing.
And that's it. Brilliant. Thank you, Luca. Very interesting. I think this model is quite interesting also in these sort of recovery times where a lot of DMOs are also eager to show sort of their own, their own value creation, both to sort of the, the destination holistically, as you say, but also to each of their partners within the destination. So do you, is, do you see a, an increased demand from DMOs in terms of showing the concrete results of marketing? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like to show the concrete um, result is definitely one of the main uh, uh, requests that we have from existing clients and new clients. The, um, and this is where probably we, the advantage of digital and data is really uh, showing the impact. Um, however, it's also a culture. So you don't change a culture overnight. So that's where some DMOs maybe are not ready to immediately or, 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 or probably they might um, uh, want too fast certain results while they the, um, they might take time to have a culture of return on investment and a strategy for return on investment. So I would say, yes, the request is high, but we always need to be careful on trying to do the right steps because it's not the, the data driven approach or the ROI approach. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm. And actually, there's a there's a great example uh, or a question also in the in the Q and A, which because I'm thinking that I think a lot of DMOs kind of this would resonate with with them. But the question is about any sort of if you've experienced any legal constraints for the cooperative model. For you know, a lot of the European DMOs are either fully or semi publicly funded, so there might be some constraints in terms of working with private companies. So how does that work? Very very good question. So this is a program that's been launched. Uh, before uh, COVID in US. In US, it's easier. It's in US, the co-op tool, it's used before COVID has been used uh, for a long time. And, and they have different way to, to, for funding that allows them to do more collaboration with private sector. However, that doesn't mean that in Europe or internationally, co-op doesn't work. Because for example, one way is to um, do a co-op between DMOs. So already having um, the regional tourist board or even the national tourist board to actually push their own DMOs to, to collaborate, that's one way. And this is possible pretty much ev everywhere. I haven't seen many restrictions. However, yes, from a private point of view, it's challenging. Mm. And this is where the, um, it really depends. So it's, uh, it, it's obviously some, for some nation is an early stage. And we need to realize that. Uh, however, that the reason why we expanded globally is because we think that it will become also legislation will need to change to allow a faster recovery and a better collaboration between private and, uh, and public. So let's talk about it. Some won't be ready to apply, but at least the co-op DMO DMO can be still uh, activated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there is a lot of talk of the need of reimagining the model and the business model and the funding models for DMOs. So this is a good way to start the conversation on that. So thank you, Luca. We're, uh, time is going really fast, but I want to thank you and also thank you, Dan, for joining us for now. Um, and actually with this, now we've dived into multiple aspects of all the changes happening, what the data can tell us, the trend analysis, um, and then how the DMO should adapt, approach, and explore new tools, models, partnerships, methodologies. And so for our final speaker of this uh, pre-conference, that's actually also kind of our segue into the conference next week, because while we know now at least more about the present and hopefully also a little bit more about the coming, um, we've also several times discussed now that it's, you know, there's uncertainty. These are VUCA times. And, uh, and so you could say that maybe new normal is that. Maybe new normal is uncertainty. It's chaos. It's changes happening all the time. And so in the words of a French writer and philosopher, just to go there, uncertainty is an uncomfortable position, but certainty is a, an absurd one. That's the words of Voltaire. I forgot to mention the name. And so I think perhaps the best thing that we can do now is to get comfortable with uncertainty. And that's what our final speaker of today will help us do. 
And this is actually also our very first outside incomer perspective, as well as our first disaster class, as we call it. So we're shifting from faster class to disaster class. Uh, coming from ASML, one of Europe's most valuable tech companies, an innovation leader in the semiconductor industry, who provides chip who provides chip makers with everything that they need. Um, we're now joined with Kuno Huisman, director of business control twin scan factory, who is a man of several hats, you could say. Um, he's also full professor of decision making under uncertainty with Tilburg University. And Kuno will inspire us with an outsider's perspective on how to enable quality decisions, even in situations of intense uncertainty. So get ready for our first disaster class. Kuno, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks for the nice introduction and thanks for having me. Um, so like Sydney said, I, I have a, actually a dual role. So I work at ASML. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And next to that, um, yeah, I have a chair at Tilburg University on decision-making on uncertainty, which is, yeah, especially in these times, of course, uh, um, yeah, good to, to think about. Um, so let me first introduce ASML a little bit. Um, so what Signal already said, so ASML is, is busy in the, and working in the semiconductor industry. And yeah, ASML is one of the, the, the companies uh, that is uh, that present there. Um, most, most of you may have heard, of course, about Intel, Samsung, uh, these companies that make uh, chips and also sell products with chips, like, uh, like Samsung selling phones. Uh, now, Apple is, of course, also a big uh, phone company. But Apple doesn't produce its own chips. They use a company in, in Taiwan for that, which is called TSMC. And then TSMC buys the machines from ASML. That's a little bit how the supply chain works. And then ASML, in turn, buys a lot of components from a lot of companies around the world. Uh, so, for example, if we look here at this, this uh, on the right uh, height hand side, we see a machine of ASML, and there is a big lens in, and this lens is coming from Carl Zeiss from Germany. So it's a, it's a huge collaboration uh, to make uh, such kind of machine. And I think everybody, especially in these, uh, in these times where we have conferences online, it's really hard to imagine uh, a, a world without chips. Yeah? So it's uh, everywhere around us. It's uh, in cars, it's in these computers that we use to do this conference, uh, but it's also in human brains uh, nowadays, yeah? like pacemakers, these kind of things. And it's all driven by, by semiconductors, uh, the, the chips are behind that. So ASML makes these machines. It's a, it's a company that has been grown quite fast over the couple of, last couple of years. I joined ASML in 2010, and there were like 10,000 people working. Nowadays, we are more than like 28,000 people. So it's uh, more than doubling and almost tripling in, in 10, year, 10, 11 years time. Last year, uh, our sales was 14 billion, uh, which you'll see in the left graph uh, below. Uh, we set ourselves a, a target of 13 billion uh, three years ago. Uh, so 2018, we did an investments day and we say we, we're going to reach the, the 13 billion and then we made 14 billion last year. And this year we, we, we expect to hit uh, more than, uh, than 18 billion. Uh, and yeah, we have a sales corridor for 2025 between 15 and 24. And that's all, of course, driven by uncertainty in the world. And uh, so what are those big uncertainties for ASML? If you look at these times, uh, ASML is one of the companies that does better because of the, the crisis. Yeah, so that's maybe not, uh, 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 of course, in all industries like tourism, it's quite different. But for ASML, this, uh, these times are actually very good because everybody started buying new equipment to do online conferences, to do video calling, these kind of things. So that's one trend that we see that, of course, is a, yeah, hopefully for everybody in the world, it's just a, a short time shock to the, to the system. Uh, but then we also see long term trends. And one of them is, for example, the implementation of 5G, yeah, so the newer uh, internet uh, speeds, um, which need, need new devices, but also new hardware and new chips. Um, and next to that, um, yeah, we see, of course, connected cars uh, and uh, all the things uh, around those uh, trends. And that makes us see that, yeah, this, this, this is not, uh, this, this, this market will grow for, for quite some time into the future. So we are, we are a company based in the Netherlands. Uh, so the headquarters is in the Netherlands. So you see a picture uh, in the, in the, down below on the right hand side of the screen. Um, it's, it's a, it's a spin-off of Philips Electronics in the Netherlands, um, but uh, it's a lot bigger than, uh, than Philips Electronics at the moment. Yeah, so we are Europe's biggest tech company at the moment. Uh, I saw yesterday on LinkedIn that we are now even uh, number 20 on the most valuable companies in the world. Yeah, so number one is Apple, as you might know, but number 20 is ASML. 
we spend more than two billion every year on uh, on budget on R and D yeah, to really develop the newest uh, and greatest machines so that we can deliver everything for to our customers and so that they can make products that everybody in the, in the world can enjoy and also enhance their lives with. But this is all nice, but it's it's it has been a yeah, journey of, of course, a lot of uncertainty that you also see it on the left uh, bottom uh, graph where you see 2009, which has been a year with a very small turnover for ASML. And that was all, of course, be because of the, the economic crisis in end of 2008 when Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed. So it's all about managing uncertainties so how, and, and unknowns. So how do you do that in a good way? And at ASML, uh, we, we started thinking about this uh, just before the crisis, 2008. I didn't join the company yet, but there were some people there that started to embrace a method that has been developed uh, on uh, on decision making. And um, the remainder of the of the talk, I will want to give you a very short, uh, I would say, uh, introduction to this. But it's, I think. Yeah, for me, it has been very useful in the last 11 years, not only in the company, but in yeah, any decision you make as a human being. And why is decision making important, if you ask me, is because that's the only way you can steer your life. If you don't make decisions, other people will make decisions and uncertainty will, yeah, will make, give you a path into the future. If you want to control it or at least steer it, then you have to make decisions. Then you better learn how to do that in a at least on, 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 on a perspective on uh, how, you, how you can do that and how you can measure that. So let's go on to decision making. Um, so we use what, we, what is then called the decision quality framework. Um, and there are two things I would like to, to, to give you away in this talk. One is that uh, you shouldn't uh, confuse a decision with its outcome. But that these are two th different things. So you shouldn't look at the outcome to judge the quality of a decision. You should judge the quality of a decision at the moment you make the decision. Come back to that later. And the other one is, of course, decision quality concept. Okay, if you cannot look at the outcome, how can you then judge the quality of a decision? And therefore, you have this decision quality framework, which I'll introduce. But first, let's go into a little bit of the de definitions. And so for me, this decision is an irrevocable allocation of resources, meaning I cannot turn it around. And so you decided to, to spend some time at this conference at the moment. You cannot turn it around, uh, say, after half an hour and say, OK, I'm going to do something different with the last past three hours. That doesn't work. It's irreversible. It's, uh, has been the, the, the resources have been allocated. Same can happen, of course, with money. You can spend money. And maybe you cannot sell uh, the things that you bought for the same price. You have to think about buying a car, going back to the, to the, to the garage, uh, uh, to the shop uh, two days later and try to get the same money back. It will be at least partly uh, irreversible. So what is then a good decision? One that is logical and that's based on the uncertainties, values, preferences, come back to that, of the decision maker. And then what is a good outcome is something that, of course, that you like and, uh, and that, that you value high and that's, that's also maybe profitable. But if you look at it, then, then you can, of course, make a good decision and then you hope you get a good outcome. But you will know that only after... Uh, some time. You can also make a good decision, but you can lead to a bad outcome. The other thing that can happen, of course, you can also make a bad decision according to some standards and then cause a bad outcome can happen. But the same, you can also be lucky, you can do a bad decision and still have a good outcome. Yeah, so it's important to know the difference between a decision and an outcome. Yeah, so the, the, and why do we have four arrows here and not only two? That's because of the, there is, of course, uncertainty in the world. Yeah, so it's not certain if I make a good decision that I will lead to a good outcome. Our studies have shown that uh, companies that use this, this kind of concepts, they more often make good decisions and they also more often get good outcomes. But you can never have a, a certainty yeah, because yeah, well, some, some things we cannot control as human being and maybe also better. There is still always be uncertainty, but you have to embrace it and you have to kind of deal with it and see that you're ready for it. So just um, a small hypothetical example of a good decision and a good outcome to let you know a little bit about the decision and an outcome difference. So assume you go to a pub uh, on a Saturday evening. It's uh, Netherlands that can, uh, you can go there now till 12 uh, very soon uh, and you drink some, some alcohol then uh, and you go back home and you see your car and you think, oh, I can drive still. Uh, so as you step in your car and you drive home and I think you're still uh, because you, you drunk some alcohol, it's a bad decision to drive and maybe you come home very safely, then it's a good outcome. But it's, it has, it will always stay a bad decision. It's not that because everything turns out to be fine, 
that it was a good decision. The other way around can also happen, of course. You think, now I cannot drive myself. Uh, let me call a tap, uh, a, a cab. And you step in a taxi, and a taxi driver doesn't pay attention, and he drives the car into a tree. And still, I think it's a good decision not to drive yourself, but you're very unlucky, and you have a bad outcome. And so be aware of these differences and try to judge the quality of a decision at the moment that you make the decision. And so also in these corona times, uh, a lot of times co uh, companies, but also governments, had to make decisions with, yeah, with little information. So you cannot judge after two months saying that was a bad decision. You have to go back two months in time. And maybe it was a bad decision because more information was available and they, they should have judged differently. But be aware that you cannot use the information, of course, of the coming two months because you don't know. So if you cannot look at the outcome, then the question, of course, arises, okay, what can I then have a look at? Um, and that's the, where the decision quality concept comes in. And let me introduce it to you. Um, so there are six elements to this uh, decision quality concept. Uh, what I already said, you can use this for any decision you make. So be it in a company, be it in the government, be it at home. Um, uh, it's, it's applicable for any decision. And I'm not saying that you all should start only using um, this, this method, which is, of course, uh, a, a, a very um, a logical way how to do it. It's, it doesn't say anything about emotions uh, and, and, and belly feeling. Um, I say it should be aligned. Huh? So you, you always have, of course, have to also listen to what your body says. And you have to see if that's aligned with maybe this kind of more clinical and logical way says. And then you can bring it together and see where, where maybe there are some, uh, some differences. But it gives you at least also a kind of a language to talk about uh, decision making. So it's depicted here as a chain of six links, meaning that the weakest link determines the, the quality of the decision. Yeah, so if, if you, for example, at number one is appropriate frame, if you see that as the weakest links, then you have to invest more time to really understand what the problem is. Yeah, because the decision frame is about what's the context and what is, what, what is really needed. And so thinking about the decision, for example, here in the office that I am now from ASML, then we restructured um, the offices uh, a couple of years ago. But is then the question just to restructure this room that I'm now in, put in new furniture, or was it the whole floor or maybe the whole building? So what's the, what's the scope of the decision? So make sure you all agree on the scope, and then you can start thinking about number two, alternatives. So what can I choose from? Is it indeed... Um, different desks that can also move in height? Is it uh, office chairs from a certain color? These kind of alternatives you can put in and show them also the alternatives that, we, that are there. And so if I look at um, the presentations we make and, and, and advices we give uh, within ASML, then we always want to show at least uh, more than one alternative. Otherwise, no decision has to be made. Show what could be viable and what could be distinct choices. That's very important. And the third one, that's about information. And here uncertainties plays a big role. So you want to know uh, later on, what's the impact of this uncertainty on my decision? How can uncertainty turn my decision around? So maybe if there is only a small uncertainty set, um, you might say decision A is the best, but given that maybe the uncertainty set is actually a little bit wider, maybe it may be good to go for a different uh, alternative. So make sure that you describe it well and that you get all the right information. Then the fourth element, and that's about what do I want to achieve with this decision? So what's the value metric to look at? And so ASML is a stock listed company. I already mentioned it's the number 20 in the world of, of uh, valued companies, companies at the moment. But it doesn't mean that all the decisions ASML makes or are made within ASML are there because, because of our uh, shareholders. And so our CEO always talks about uh, he has five different stakeholders. One is, of course, shareholders, but he also has suppliers because we heavily re uh, rely on suppliers. The other one is our customers, of course. The other ones are our employees. And then there is an, we also have a role in the environment. So like, like here in the Netherlands, but also uh, worldwide, we also have presence in, in different parts of, the, con of, uh, of the, um, the world. We also have a local uh, responsibility. Yeah, so we sponsor, for example, a local soccer uh, team here in, uh, in Eindhoven. You do do that because you want to have a, a viable environment for your employees to work. So what is then the most important of these five if you make a decision? And, and, and do you agree on that? And do you also understand then uh, what, what that drives it? And then the fifth one is, can I 
come to logical reasoning to show which alternative is best given these value metrics and the information that I have. So I have an information set. I have uh, descriptions of uncertain uncertainty. I know what I can choose from. I know what I want to achieve because I know my value metrics. What is then the best thing to do? And it also gives you the story to explain to people why this decision has been made. So I've seen it very yeah, in a good way that you can also bring the story across and also have it helps you with implementing it. And last but not least, it's about commitment to action. How do I know for sure that if I make a decision, it also is also put into action? I can make a very good decision, but if it's no action, then all decision making has been waste. And of course, you really need to know you have to come to this action. It also, of course, has to do with um, stakeholder management, uh, getting people along in the process, uh, making sure that the right people are on the table when you have to discuss all these things. So this concept, it's it's not rocket science. It's quite simple, I would say, but that has given ASML a way to deal with, with decision making in a certain world and in a certain environment that ASML is in, because we have to kind of look ahead five to 10 years, yeah, because we're now planning the, the technology that we need as a human human uh, race to say humankind so to say for um, for 10 years ahead to make those decisions in a good way and to have discussions about it and to, to make sure that we know that or maybe really we have to make clear what what is a really our, our value objective yeah, is it because we want to be technology leader is it because we want to do something for our, for our employees is it something that we want to do because we have also shareholders of course on, on the stock exchange but all these things have to mingle together and then uncertainty plays a plays a role very much in this framework, and it can also yeah be be used of course in a, in a kind of modeling sense that you can use to think about scenarios and all these kind of things that you can help you to come to your right decisions. So it's important to to understand this concept. That's one thing. And what we did within ASML is also uh, make sure that the decision makers, so the CEO and all these people, understand this, and they also um, Enhance it, of course, by executing their decision rights, as we call it. So if they say, they, somebody comes, you have to make the decision, that they say, yeah, but I don't see enough information. Please make sure that you have everything on the table. And so they have also language for this. So I, I hope this will help you uh, all in making good and uh, good decisions for your for yourself and, uh, and for, for all the things that you want to do in your life. So thanks for the podium. Thank you very much, Kuno. I thought that was very, very interesting. And it just goes to show that you can learn, you can learn things from outside your own uh, industry bubble, you could say. I, I had one question, um, which throughout the pandemic crisis, what I've seen is a lot of, because it has been a lot of uncertainty and uh, around a lot of topics, but also very much around tourism and restrictions changing and what can we do and what can't we do. And I've seen quite a few places, both cities and DMOs that sort of talk about it, then they make a decision to do something under uncertainty, and then they talk about it as an experiment. And to me, that sort of framing, as you were saying, the language, that framing often is, is a way almost of framing, like we don't know the outcome, but what you're saying is that doesn't actually qualify the decision in itself. No, so so you of course with your value metric, the number four here, you want to say something about uh, the, the, the possibility of what kind of outcome I go, I'm going to reach, which you should be you shouldn't judge the quality of the decision after you've seen the outcome. So you can, it's good to do a pilot, for example, or to do some, try something and say, I, we expect this to happen. But I think what we learned um, us the most, I think, uh, in a lot of places, of course, you have to be kind of agile. You have to be, you need to respond quick to these kind of changes. Because what we see, of course, also is that the changes in the world come seem to come faster than they were. And how do you respond to that in a good way? But still keeping your focus. Eh? So it's not that ASML predicts everything because uh, very accurate. No, it's about the direction also. And if the direction is clear, then you and you, and you move in that direction. You keep that path. And in the short term, of course, you have to uh, you have to sometimes try things out and also to come to the conclusion this is indeed not a good way, and also be able to turn it back. So there's also a question in the Q&A. Would you say that in many ways the, the objective in the sense of the framework is also to secure agility and flexibility in decision-making? Yeah, it's, it's a few things. One is that you, you open up 
a new structure the discussion about decisions so sometimes most a lot of times people are just sitting together so to say and try to make a decision but it's not clear where where they really have to decide upon so make sure you have a quite clear decision again that what have do i decide now what can i decide tomorrow and yeah, that's already i think a good distinction to to make and then that you all have the same information and the same possibility set and and also that you include as many as possible different views that you have also yeah that you're kind of certain that you have the right choice in it because if people are only thinking in the same way then i think it's not const uh yeah what do you say that not, not um you will not maybe not come to the to the to a, a surprising alternative so to say but you that's what you have to look for in these times and yeah and also by looking at the different ones maybe you also have kind of a backup plan then you know already okay if i have turned around then maybe i have to go the other direction but then i could have to do this and this because that's already what i planned for right so it, it makes you need agile but you also yeah you're not just going one direction and say that you don't turn around uh, turn around again you're constantly evaluating <clears throat> sorry exactly yeah yeah all right. Well, thank you so much, Kuna. That, that, that was really, really interesting. And uh, we're out of time. And I also see we're three minutes past half. Um, and so while there may be uncertainty, I do know what time it is. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to uh, finish off by saying thank you to you, Kuna, to all our speakers, and to everyone who tuned in for this uh, pre-conference. Um, and uh, I think what we can see now is there's a lot more to discuss, and there's a lot more to learn. And uh, there there's also no need to worry because this is not a goodbye. This is a hopefully see you next week for the conference on September 23rd and 24th.